Welcome, everyone. My name is Terry Erzman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Percona. Uh, I will uh, take care of a little housekeeping here and then uh, kick off the webinar. If you can hear me, would you please raise your hand in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel to indicate that it uh, sounds fine. Very good. See lots of hands. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate that. We will be recording today's webinar, and uh, we'll post a recording, uh, a link to the recording, as well as a copy of the uh, presentation slides within the next uh, 24 hours, and we'll send an email to uh, the uh, email address you use to register with a, uh, with a link to the page that includes the recording and the slides. Uh, throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions through the questions panel in your go to webinar control um, uh, panel, and uh, we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. It's now with uh, pleasure that uh, I hand the webinar over to Bill Carwin. He's a principal consultant at Procona, and Bill is speaking on full text search throwdown. Bill? Thanks very much, Terry, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about full text search as it relates to developing applications with MySQL. First, let's try to just set a baseline for uh, what we understand about what full text search is meant to solve. If you have a database that contains a lot of text that has uh, large blocks of paragraphs and uh, text and you want to be able to search for keywords within it, it's uh, a little bit difficult to envision how to set that up with conventional indexes since indexes would index the, uh, the whole string starting from the leftmost portion and are limited in length. You could have text much larger than the, the, uh, the limit, and you wouldn't be able to search for words that are in the middle of that text. What I did then was to try to compare different solutions for full text search uh, indexes that are specialized to searching for keywords within a large block of text. What I used for test data was a data dump from Stack Overflow. It's a popular technical question and answer site for programmers who probably come across it. And uh, they publish their data in a raw form periodically. I'm using the uh, data dump from December 2011. The, uh, the principal table that has all the text in it is called posts. It has over 7.4 million rows in it, uh, about 8 gigabytes. So it's a sufficient test data uh, sample so that it would be uh, large enough so that it's not trivially searchable, uh, but certainly many of you may have even larger data sets. The data dump that they provide uh, looks approximately like this, and the uh, text that I'm concentrating on are in just a few columns of the posts table. The posts has both questions and answers that uh, uh, pertain to the traffic on that question and answer site. And there's a, a short string for title, so it's like the subject of the question. There's a body uh, field, which has the majority of the content. And then there's tags, which is up to five uh, keywords that are associated with that post. So we're going to try to uh, look at how we would uh, search any of those simultaneously with different solutions. And the point of this exercise is to compare them uh, apples to apples, so uh, not necessarily going into all the uh, specialized features of each one of them. What I see a lot of people doing with development of applications to look for uh, keywords within larger blocks of text is what I call naive search predicates. And this uh, relates to a classic quote from Jamie Zawinski, some people when confronted with a problem think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. Now they have two problems. So the issues with using these types of uh, search predicates, either the like predicate or regular expression predicates, is one, the, there's accuracy issues. They don't do a very good job of noticing word boundaries. So you could search for a string, but not necessarily match strings as a whole word. You would see a string that occurs within a larger word. There are some meta characters in the regular expression uh, syntax for MySQL that uh, matches word boundaries. It's rather funny looking, the double 
square brackets, colon, angled bracket. I'm not sure that they could have made that any more verbose, but uh, it's, it, its intention is to try to match word boundaries so that you don't get the problems with uh, uh, false matches. But the more important issue with these sort of naive search predicates is the speed. If we try to use uh, substring matching against a large table like our 8 gigabyte posts table, we end up finding that uh, the search takes an inordinately long time, much, much longer than would be uh, satisfactory for a web application performance. 49 seconds for regular like and almost 8 minutes when you're using regular expressions over this table. And it's just going to get worse as we get a larger data set. Why exactly is that? I like to use the uh, comparison to a uh, telephone book. If we have a, a table for a telephone book where we're indexing the full name, last name first, first name last, and we add a couple of names into there, and then we try to search if we search for strings that are on the leftmost portion of that text, so people whose last name is Thomas in this case, this can use the index. It's, it's sorted by the leftmost portion of the string. But if we try to put the wildcard at the beginning of our pattern match, it can't use the index. It doesn't know where within the uh, alphabetized last names that first name occurs. So it essentially has to search the entire table. That's the uh, basic explanation for that. And ultimately we have to keep in mind that conventional B-tree indexes, which is the uh, type of index used by most uh, index declarations in MySQL, can't search for substrings. Anytime you have a wildcard at the beginning of a uh, pattern, it was not gonna, it's not going to work to search for substrings. And likewise, if you have wildcards at both ends of your pattern and so on. So we need other solutions. There are a number of other solutions on the market now uh, in the open source uh, world, and we'll, I'm going to compare these. Full text indexes in MyISOM, full text indexes in InnerDB, which is uh, coming in 5.6, Apache Solar, Sphinx Search, and a solution called TriGraphs, which I'll describe later. Full text search in MyISOM has been a part of the product for a long, long time. You've probably tried it and come across it. It, you, you just declare it with a special index type uh, with a keyword full text. And the nice thing is that it's totally integrated in with SQL. It uh, makes sure, like any index, that it stays in sync with the data. There are special uh, functions that you can use to search it. I'll show you an example. And it's not the most sophisticated uh, full text search solution out there, but it does create a nice balance. If we uh, test how long it takes to uh, copy data into a table that has uh, that index declared on it. So say I started with an empty table posts and I imported a, a all uh, 7 million rows into it. In my benchmark, it took 33 minutes, 34 seconds. A slight difference if I already had a populated table and I create the index on that table. So uh, I already had a table full of uh, 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 the text and I just create an index on it in place, it takes almost as long, 31 minutes, 18 seconds. Querying this full text index is pretty easy. Uh, the functions are match and against, so you name the columns that are declared as your uh, index. You have to name all the columns of your index and in the order that you define them in the index. And then there's a query pattern that you list as a uh, uh, string in the against function. For example, if we have uh, title, body, and tags as the definition of our index, we can mention those in the match function and then list our pattern in the against. There's two different modes uh, with this against matching. You can either match in natural language mode or Boolean mode. So I tested both. And in the case of natural language mode for this data set in this pattern, it took 200 milliseconds consistently. And I tested multiple times so that I wasn't getting uh, skewed results because it was loading the index into memory. So I would repeat, uh, repeat the test over and over again against hopefully a warmed up uh, key cache. 
looking at the query profiler built into MySQL, we can see where it was spending its time. In spite of the fact that I ran this uh, test multiple times, this sample of the profile report is from not the first invocation, but several invocations in. So presumably it had a warmed up key cache, and yet the, almost a, the entire amount of time that it was spending uh, doing this query was in a mode full text initialization. Using the other mode, Boolean mode, we have a mini language that uh, allows us to use Boolean uh, operators and pluses and things that uh, uh, allows for a little bit more precise uh, control over the pattern that we're searching for. In this case, it took only 16 milliseconds to do this search uh, against the same data with the same pattern. And in the profile, we see that the full text initialization takes hardly any time at all, but the majority of the time of that 16 milliseconds is spent sending data. Sending data, you may be aware, in MySQL just means that it's copying data from one uh, internal buffer to another. So it's essentially moving large amounts of data around in memory. I used to think that sending data meant it's sending it over the network, but it's a different phase. Let's compare that to the new feature in uh, InnoDB in uh, MySQL 5.6 that has its own full text indexing that they're uh, developing. For this test, I tried to download the latest development release, 5.6.6 M1, and uh, found that the usage is very similar, the declaring indexes and using the match and against predicates, uh, very similar to how we're familiar of using them in MyISM. But the internal storage and how it's uh, optimized is much, much different. And there's limited information on that uh, uh, just yet. There's a, a few blog posts that were posted by the developers of this feature um, about a year ago. And those are really worthwhile reading. They're very interesting to see how they uh, implemented this. There are some uh, footnotes about the, the uh, concept of indexes are always in sync with data. There's some garbage collection that happens asynchronously in the background for uh, deleting entries and uh, integrating new inserts into the data. So there's a little bit of nuance there, but hopefully it appears almost all the time that uh, the indexes are in sync with the text data. You can read those blog posts for more details. Uh, I wouldn't uh, try to rephrase their explanation. So repeating this, the similar test that we did before, trying to uh, copy raw data into a table that has the index defined, and, and so uh, building up the full text index uh, uh, row by row, we find that this takes 55 minutes, 46 seconds, so quite a bit longer than it did with my ISOM. I next tried the, the test of trying to build the index on existing data, uh, and I found a problem. This uh, there's I found that trying to do that on my existing uh, posts table uh, caused MySQLD to crash. It uh, allocated uh, more memory than the system had and got an out of memory failure and an assertion and shut down. And I investigated that and I found out that, that it's very, very important in the current implementation of the InnoDB full text search that your table has a primary key column named FTS underscore doc underscore ID. And it has to be literally that string, even to the point of it has to match that capitalization. And it has to be an unsigned big int. So that's an absolute requirement in the current implementation. They have uh, said something in the blog posts about uh, expecting to become more flexible in the future to try to allow for uh, user specifiable primary key column name and data type. But so far, this is the requirement. So once I changed my posts table to have that uh, column type and name as the primary key, then I was able to create the full text index. Uh, and that only took 25 minutes, 27 seconds. So it's uh, quite a bit faster, almost uh, half the time that it took to insert the data into that table incrementally. Using the full text index in InnoDB is very similar. Uh, you can use the natural language mode. In this case, it, was, it ran in 740 milliseconds. And like with my ISOM, a large portion of that time was spent in full text initialization, 
followed by sending data. It was a bit faster to use Boolean mode, like with my ISIM. Uh, in InnoDB, it only took 350 milliseconds. Uh, still a lot slower than it is in my ISIM, uh, but you know, better than the natural language mode. And again, full text initialization is the majority of the time spent for that 350 milliseconds. The next solution I compared was Apache Solar. This was originally a, a branch of the, uh, or a companion project for the uh, Lucene project. In fact, the URL for the solar page is still at lucene.apache.org. Those uh, two projects have become integrated, so the, the Lucene code is still part of Solar, but it's uh, kind of under the covers. Solar is the official product that they uh, point to. The implementation is in Java, so uh, if you are a project that is accustomed to using a Java container or application server, this will probably be more familiar to you, but uh, if you want to use Solar for another type of project that is not Java, you'd have to still uh, uh, bite the bullet and start operating a Java application server for this. It's not too hard to set this up. Uh, I found that uh, a few tweaks with my uh, Java runtime and class path and things, uh, it was able to, I was able to launch this okay. And like I have said many times, 99% of problems with Java are related to class path. The uh, solar server, once started up in this uh, Java container, is has a web service architecture. So you use utilize it via a uh, HTTP API. There's a lot of features that I'm not going to be talking about today in solar. Very sophisticated uh, things for faceted search and uh, uh, stemming and uh, all kinds of uh, sophisticated uh, full text features. But since I'm comparing it to other products that don't have those features, I wanted to limit it to the sort of common uh, features of all. Configuring a uh, uh, solar instance to bring in data uses a tool that comes with solar called the data import handler. And here's an example of a minimal uh, configuration uh, block in your uh, solarconfig.xml that declares, I want to do a data import. Uh, that'll be the uh, web API. Uh, endpoint and maps to this class data import handler and there's a, a name of the configuration file for the, the data source data config.xml which we'll see in here this declares a JDBC data source for the uh, uh, instance of MySQL and the, the database that you're going to be selecting from in the my case it's on localhost and my database name is test pattern one of the uh, caveats that I found was very, very important was to uh, set the batch size equals to negative one so that you end up uh, bringing in the data row by row instead of having to buffer it. Without that setting, it actually tried to uh, bring in the entire content of the uh, query that I have listed below in this block before it starts to index it. Since the table I was indexing was very large, this was much, much too large in, uh, for Java to hold in, in one uh, byte. So that was very important. I thought I'd share that to save uh, some people some time uh, as you see the uh, data import handler crashing because it runs out of memory repeatedly. There's also a schema.xml that you have to write. Like many Java projects, it relies a lot on XML configuration files. And this was the example that I used uh, for my experiment. That I declared different fields that are drawn from the data source to uh, declare them whether or not they should be indexed or uh, stored in the index and whether they're required in the uh, source data or not. <clears throat> some of the uh, items have parent ID, some don't. The answers essentially have parent ID. So they don't, we can't require that in all cases. Then the other uh, data types are uh, those that are actually the uh, text that we want to search through. In this case, I have a meta field text that's a generic uh, name that doesn't correspond to any one of the physical columns in the data source. But I have declared that I'm going to copy the uh, uh, content of title, body, and tags into that virtual column. And that's what it's actually going to be indexing.
that's just a, the way that uh, data in the uh, solar works is that you have to declare which fields are going to be drawn from the data source and then which fields are actually going to be indexed in the uh, index. Okay, so down to the measurements. Trying to draw the data from the data source into solar is invoked by a uh, uh, web API front end. So the uh, uh, tool is data import corresponding to that uh, web da uh, entry point. And I, the command for that Java servlet is full import. This took 14 minutes, 28 seconds. After you have that indexed, trying to do a query against it uh, is done with a different uh, servlet, the select servlet. And there I can specify the query of, I'm going to search for MySQL and performance as keywords. There's a lot more to the uh, syntax of issuing queries, but this is just the uh, simple version that I was using to compare against the other solutions. This ran in about 70 milliseconds consistently, even after I warmed up the caches and uh, uh, ran this query repeatedly. Uh, except what I found is uh, Solar has an optimization that's very similar to the MySQL query cache, that given a, given, uh, given a query, uh, specific keywords that you're searching for, it will actually try to buffer the result of that query in uh, quickly accessible RAM, so that if you search for the exact same keywords subsequently, it comes back in a lot less time. So whereas I said 79 milliseconds here for the speed of the query, that was the initial uh, query for those keywords. Subsequently, uh, searching for the exact same uh, keywords took very, very little time. Uh, uh, almost immeasurable amount of time because it was fetching a uh, uh, prepared query result that had been cached. So down to about one millisecond. Of course in production this would not be typical. You'd have a number of users searching for all different types of uh, combinations of keywords so you, your overall opportunity for uh, caching those might be a lot less. That's why I listed the 79 milliseconds as the, the baseline for that. I also considered Sphinx search, which is a quite popular solution. This is a project that's been around for quite some time, uh, over 10 years. It's a GPL license. Instead of Java, this is implemented in C++. Uh, and, uh, it uh, runs as uh, either a standalone or uh, as a daemon on your uh, search server. There is a plugin for MySQL, a storage engine plugin that allows uh, queries in a MySQL connection to uh, make queries against a, a Sphinx index as though it is a table. So you can actually treat the Sphinx index through the, stor the storage engine interface as something you can query on the same uh, session as you do querying other database tables. But even if you don't do that, even if you don't use the Sphinx storage engine, your application could connect using the MySQL protocol to the Sphinx daemon. And I'll show you an example. Sphinx also has a lot of uh, sophisticated search features that I'm not going to be going into today. There are other uh, sources for that information. Setting up a data source for Sphinx is very simple. Instead of XML, it uses this kind of, uh, kind of pseudo JSON type of syntax, but it's a lot more readable uh, than XML is. And essentially, it's a, a data source configuration where you declare the host database user password, and then a query that is, it's going to use for a given index. So the uh, select query against uh, some columns and, and, uh, of your table, and then the query info is if you need to follow up on a, a given found ID returned by that uh, SQL query, you can get the rest of the columns using the SQL query info uh, uh, query. Once you declare that data source, you can create one or more indexes using the data source. And this is the minimal uh, version of the configuration. You, all you need is to, to say for a given index, what data source do I use and where do I store the data? Filling the index with data is done with a command line tool indexer. You uh, declare the the configuration file that you stored the previous information in, and then uh, the name of the index, in my case test1 is the uh, name of the index, and let it run. And I uh, used a tool for Windows called ptime to measure this, and found the execution time took 
eight minutes, 20 seconds to fill that up. So quite a bit better than the 55 to, th you know, down to 35, 25 minutes for the uh, other uh, cases, and even faster than solar. And it does give you some good information about how much, how many rows are processed and how long it took per row and all the uh, I.O. that it took. Here's an example of using the MySQL protocol to do these queries. You can see that if I am in a MySQL session, I just need to specify the port of the Sphinx search daemon. It's a distinct port uh, from the MySQL port because it's a different daemon. And it even shows me the version number, not of MySQL, but of the Sphinx daemon. 2.0.5 is the one that I'm testing. It's the current version. Uh, uh, if you want to, interestingly, you can override that and have the Sphinx daemon output any uh, string you want. So you can have it masquerade as a MySQL server by, by uh, reporting a different version, which is kind of interesting. But this is the default. Now you can tell it, just report your Sphinx version. And then since I'm in a MySQL client, I can issue queries. Sphinx has a query language that looks a lot like SQL against a, an ordinary relational table. But you notice there's one difference. Instead of saying match column names against pattern, it's a simplified match predicate. I just need to specify the, the search pattern that I'm giving. So match, no against. The result of that in the MySQL uh, client is a list of the uh, uh, top 20 matches. And you can uh, customize the, how many matches it returns as well. It doesn't give you all the, uh, the content, the, all the text from those tables. It just gives you the IDs and then the other column weight that is, uh, it, the result is sorted by default by that weight so that the best matches come to the top. In your application, you would have to use these IDs subsequently to query the, the base data in the original posts table to get the respective documents out. But you can see that running this actually uh, took a very, very small time. Sphinx search also has a show meta command in which it's a little bit like the MySQL query profiler so you can get the uh, statistics about how many hits it had and uh, what uh, for each keyword that you had in your search predicate and it gives you a, a more uh, precise number for the number of uh, milliseconds it took to uh, return that result, in this case 13 milliseconds. And the last solution that I was uh, tested is trigraphs. This is a experimental uh, solution. It doesn't require any other technology. It's uh, uh, pure SQL. So there's no dependency on a uh, version of MySQL or any storage engines or special index types. There's no third-party technology to install, but it's probably not as high performance or specialized as those other techniques. The idea is that you essentially create a, a list of every uh, possible word, every possible three-letter combination uh, for text, which isn't that many. It's 26 times 26 times 26 uh, with the Latin alphabet. Uh, and then you use that as a reference table and create a, uh, a trigraphs, a list of all those three-letter combinations. Some of those may actually never occur, like ZZZ may, may never occur, QQR, uh, probably not very useful, but many of them do occur in text. And then run through your entire data set, picking out all the, uh, uh, the three-letter combinations and storing them into this many-to-many uh, uh, -many table between your posts and your trigraphs so that you actually have uh, a very, very large table which is a mapping between the post's ID and the trigraph. This is pretty time consuming to create and it's very large. There's probably some ways we could optimize that, but this was just the initial experiment that I did. Querying it requires only joins. If you're searching for the word MySQL, you'd search for a three letter sequence from that keyword and look that up in the uh, trigraph table and then join it back to the posts table so you can find the documents where that three letter uh, uh, sequence exists. If you want to narrow down the, uh, the results by searching for uh, 
multiple keywords, you can also uh, do it that way. And you can even narrow it down further by using extra characters from the keywords that you were searching for. Once you uh, find these, you see that we're down to 13.6 seconds to search the uh, whole thing, which is a lot better than the like predicate, but still rather slow. You can you still have the possibility that those three-letter combinations don't occur in the in the order that you want. So you could end up matching strings that have the word man for miss per, and that would be what you want. Uh, you want to subsequently uh, once you find a, a narrow set that has those three-letter sequences, narrow it down further by matching with the like predicate. These like predicates wouldn't have to go against the entire table anymore. They would only go against those that match the joins. And you see that the time is still in the realm of 13 seconds. So comparing further, the, uh, uh, the ultimate end run of these shows we can measure performance in different ways. So time to insert data into the index. So if we had a table already defined with the index and we want to just pump data into it, the comparison is now easy to see. It looks like Sphinx search is the best at 8 minutes, 20 seconds, and the others vary quite a bit. Uh, Apache Solar, the other specialized search uh, daemon, is the next one, 14 minutes. The full text indexes in MyS, MinuteDB are, are uh, worse still. And then this naive solution that I came up with for trigraphs, uh, which I could work on a bit more and probably improve, but not to the level of those specialized search engine technologies, is 116 millets. It's worth mentioning that although the like expression and regular, and regular expression solutions aren't so uh, good at performing when you do queries, it does mean that you don't have to create an index at all. So looking at this graph graphically, we see exactly what the uh, uh, comparison is between the time that it takes to insert data into an index. Sphinx is the best one in this case. Comparing to building the index on existing data, uh, couldn't really do that for uh, the solar and search because the way those function, you're really uh, uh, defining the index first and then pumping data into it. This is where you have data and you're defining an index on it in place. So it's relevant only for the, the MyISM and InnoDB solutions. And in this case, we see InnoDB is quite a bit quicker than MyISM. One uh, possible explanation for this could have been that InnoDB is doing fast index creation. But I did see in the uh, blogs from the developers that they have not implemented fast index uh, creation for the InnoDB full text index yet. They do have the intention of doing that, but it's not there yet. It does have to do sort of the old school way of doing a, uh, locking the table while it's building that index. Hopefully they'll uh, improve that in upcoming releases. The index storage is another way we could uh, uh, compare these. That is, how much disk space does it take to store the index uh, for given search solutions? Again, the like expression since it doesn't actually have any index, it's going to be doing a table scan on query. It doesn't need to have any index, so that's, there's no storage required at all. That can have its own benefit. We can see the comparison between full text for my ISOM and Apache Solar and Sphinx Search and Trigraphs. Trigraphs is huge. Uh, that could probably be optimized a bit. Uh, and Sphinx is actually taking a lot more space than the others. So we saw that Sphinx was very quick to query, but it seems to be have been done as a trade-off between uh, uh, storage and speed. The question mark for the full text in a DB I put there, and I'll explain that. The uh, uh, storage for the index is not stored in conventional uh, indexes. They're stored in auxiliary tables. And they, doc they talk about this in those blogs that I linked to, that it actually creates auxiliary tables that uh, uh, store the full text index data, and then they create uh, uh, multiple indexes on that and query them transparently as a result of using your match and against functions. The problem is I couldn't find a definitive uh, way of measuring how much storage space that is taking. If you uh, do a uh, 
showing the table status of the uh, posts table, it only shows you about 100 megabytes, between 100 and 200 megabytes of storage associated with the indexes for that table, which is less than a tenth of what you would expect it to be if you compared it to the uh, MyISM and Solar and, and Sphinx. Uh, so that seems a little uh, curious. I also noticed that the uh, central table space file, the uh, IB data one in the InnoDB's case, did grow uh, to about six and a half gigabytes. But I don't know how much of that is actually due to the, uh, the auxiliary tables for the full text InnoDB. Uh, it's something to investigate further, but the uh, point is I don't have a measurement yet for exactly how much storage space it's util utilizing for that index. <clears throat> Comparing these, we see that MyISIM is the most uh, compact, uh, Solar and Sphinx are next, and then the trigraph is out to lunch. The query speed. Remember in the early part of this presentation I showed that the speed of using like expressions or regular expression uh, searches with, with uh, R like take a, a, a very, very long number of uh, seconds. And if we just uh, phrase these in terms of milliseconds, they look like they're uh, very high indeed. The full text MISM varied between uh, the natural language mode and Boolean mode, 16 to 200 milliseconds. And the InnoDB mode was 350 to 740 milliseconds. There may be some ways to speed that up. There are uh, some discussion in the blogs that they are hoping to uh, develop parallel execution uh, uh, code so that the uh, uh, building the index and uh, querying the index can be done in a multi-threaded fashion. But it's unclear whether uh, that's going to be done in time for 5.6. Apache Solar is 79 milliseconds, as I mentioned, and Sphinx Search is significantly faster. Uh, uh, I actually uh, was in contact with uh, Vlad Fedorkov, who is one of the longtime developers of Sphinx, and he advised that uh, probably the best method of, of doing the query was with the MySQL protocol, uh, the example that I showed. Trigraphs was quite slow, but still quite a bit better than using the naive approach of using like expressions. So even a, uh, the, the point there being, even a uh, uh, relatively simple solution like trigraphs is so much better than using a table scan with like that it's worthwhile. And on this chart, you can see that when you compare on the scale of the like predicate or regular expressions uh, searches, those can take so long that trying to represent on the same graph the uh, specialized full text indexes ends up diminishing almost to the point of invisibility. So let's change the scale of this graph. If we stretch it out a bit so we can actually see the, uh, the quicker ones, like and trigraph go off the scale, uh, but we can now compare the MySIM, InnoDB, Solar, and Sphinx, and you can see very uh, easily visually how much quicker Sphinx is than anything except for Boolean searches with my ISO. I can also summarize this in a uh, table here that uh, shows you the red circled um, items are the ones that are the best in their class when we're talking about measuring the time to build an index, the time to insert data into an existing index, the storage required for the index, and how fast it is to query. And then the final column is the technology involved in the solution, either something built into MySQL, like full text MySQL and full text InnoDB, for which you don't need to uh, add any other technology, or uh, something that exists with SQL in general. So it's, it's very standard. Uh, you don't even need a, a particular uh, storage engine. It'll function independently of version or storage engine. And likewise, the trigraphs is something you can implement in any storage engine in any version. This, the third-party products, Solar and Sphinx, are implemented in Java and C++. So in case that uh, you need to choose the technology based on what will fit into your environment or your team expertise, you can make that selection. So that's the bottom line of uh, uh, full-text search. I would therefore probably recommend that Sphinx Search is a, a good solution 
for most applications that need uh, full text search. It's very exciting that uh, uh, InnoDB is finally getting a, a native full text search index type. I hope that the, as they develop that uh, technology further that uh, these numbers will improve further and that uh, we can see that become, to become more competitive. And it can have value even if it isn't the absolute fastest solution to uh, have a full text index that's built into the product which is still orders of magnitude faster than the naive approach. And that's really the point that I wanted to make is that I see so many applications when I do uh, uh, consulting and training for uh, Percona customers where people are uh, upset that their database isn't running faster, but so many times I find that they are using naive-like expressions to do full text search and it's slowing down their whole website and uh, uh, making connections last for many, many seconds. Uh, and uh, really harming the concurrency capabilities. So I would recommend using any of these uh, solutions over having a, a naive expressions with like. There's only one exception to that statement, which is if it's very important to you to not have to store any index at all. So therefore, I did an honorable mention gray circle around the, the cases where the uh, use of the like expression can be advantage there. If you don't know which columns you you need to index, uh, until uh, you need to very uh, infrequently uh, search them, you could benefit by just bearing the cost of the uh, number of uh, seconds to do the search once, assuming that you won't have to do it repeatedly. So thanks very much for listening to that. I'd also like to remind you that we have some events coming up. Uh, Percona Live is going to be in New York City on October 1 to 2, and they're taking uh, registration for that now. There's another one in London for folks who are in uh, Europe. That may be more convenient. And remember that there's a, a bigger Percona Live uh, event in April in Santa Clara, California in 2013. I'm actually part of the Percona training group as well, and I wanted to give a plug for those for the Percona training group. Uh, you can find out lots of information about our services under percona.com slash training. And also check out my book. I do some comparisons not only with MySQL's text search, but also uh, text search for other uh, relational databases, Oracle, Microsoft, DB2, Postgres, and SQLite, and as well as many other topics in my book. So thanks very much for uh, listening to me, and I think we can go to questions now. If I can... Uh, uh, ask Terry to review those. <clears throat> Very good. Um, so again, uh, I will remind everyone if you would uh, like to ask any questions, please use the questions um, uh, area of your uh, go to webinar control panel to submit your questions and we'll answer uh, as many as we have. So uh, Bill, the first question is, what about MIM SQL and indexes? Have you benchmarked it? The question is about MemSQL. That's a in-memory uh, SQL queryable database. That's uh, kind of a, a, a newer product, as far as I know. I have not benchmarked that as part of this comparison, and uh, that would be an interesting one to compare. I don't actually know if they have a, uh, a full text index type. Of course, if they had uh, a, a conventional uh, the index type, like a B tree, like we're accustomed to, it would not be able to do full text indexing. You wouldn't be able to search for substrings or keywords within text. It would require some kind of uh, 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 specialized full text index to satisfy that. Uh, interesting footnote to that: uh, early on in the early days of trying to do full text search, uh, Oracle was one of the uh, uh, implementations, and the way that they did full text indexing without having a specialized index type was that they just simply stored uh, copies of the string. So you'd index the, the whole string, then you chop off the first letter and index the remaining part of the string, chop off the next letter, index the remaining part of the string, and just do that redundantly as many times as you need to to index every, every substring within the whole uh, text, which took a large amount of space, but it did allow you to search for substrings. Even Oracle has abandoned that approach because it was just not a good trade-off. But it does point out that even with conventional B-tree indexes, you could do uh, uh, any kind of uh, substring matching if you were willing to store the strings over and over and over again. 
Okay. Uh, next question. Um, were these tests performed on a single machine and a common slash share set of disks? Yeah, the machine I used for this, these tests um, uh, was a desktop machine running uh, Windows 7. Uh, it has uh, the data stored on a Samsung um, SSD drive, and the indexes that it was building were on the uh, root drive, which was also a uh, uh, SSD drive, I think a Corsair. So the uh, uh, I was trying to uh, test this on a, not a laptop. You know, I was I'm leery of people who run benchmarks and say I tested this on my laptop, which isn't really very representative. So I wanted to do something a little bit uh, better. The machine has eight gigabytes of RAM and uh, and uh, Intel i3 processor. Uh, so it, it does have four virtual cores and eight gigabytes of RAM, which I was, for each test, I was repurposing the RAM for uh, each of the respective buffers. So I was trying to give a, a healthy amount of memory to each of the different uh, products that I was using while I was running a test on them. You probably have much uh, more s uh, capable machines in your uh, deployed uh, data center the uh, you know, if you have multi-core Xeon machines with uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM and RAID systems and so on, that would be much more capable. My test machine wasn't that capable, but uh, by testing all of the, these different products on the same machine, I hope that the results are at least comparable to each other, even if they aren't representative of what you could experience in your production site. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, do you have any data on memory usage for these tests? Interesting question. Uh, I did not measure that during my benchmarks. Uh, the, the potential exists for the uh, memory to fluctuate, as it, particularly as it's building indexes. Uh, in, uh, the one uh, case that I, I did notice that was when I tried to create the InnoDB full text index without declaring the correct primary key column name. It actually tried to allocate more memory than the system had and uh, crashed the uh, uh, MySQLD and almost uh, got Windows 7 to shut down as well. So it's, uh, it, it, the amount of memory can be very important. Uh, I did not measure that for all these cases. Um, uh, there, there are also ways that you can control that, for example, the indexer for Sphinx allows you to declare a maximum amount of memory, and I, I allowed it to use uh, 2,047 megabytes, so two gigs, uh, while it was doing the indexing. Uh, did not measure that for the uh, other cases. Okay, uh, next question. Um, if searching on multiple terms, can you get Sphinx to report which matched? You can, uh, I think that there are, there are ways of using Sphinx language to give weighting to the different search terms so that you can uh, control which ones of them are going to affect the result more in terms of the overall weight. Uh, and there are a lot of options for the uh, query language in that sense. Um, I didn't explore all of those different uh, options because I was trying to kind of go for the lowest common denominator to compare uh, these different solutions. But yeah, the, uh, both Solar and Sphinx have some pretty sophisticated ways that you can control the, the uh, pattern matching uh, uh, and which words are more important to your result. Okay, uh, next question is, um, did, did you retrieve the same number of rows on each benchmark? Uh, in terms of retrieving the uh, rows, uh, uh, like uh, how much overhead could be associated with reading them off of disk or transferring them around in memory, yeah, the 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 end result was very similar or identical uh, in each run of my uh, tests. Of course, in order to try to get a, a uh, average, I did run each test multiple times uh, and even uh, you know shut down my SQL and and restarted it to clear buffers uh, and got a pretty consistent result. So the, the number of rows returned was consistent from run to run. And that leads me to think that it's pretty deterministic. It's not, it's not a fuzzy matching. It's, it's really rather uh, precise. 
in all cases. Okay, uh, next question. With respect to solar and Sphinx, uh, do indexes stay up to date with changes? For example, inserts, updates, and deletes. That's a, a very good question. I did not address that during the presentation, but I meant to. One of the big advantages to using the built-in indexes for MySQL table storage engines, either MySQL or InnoDB, is that like other indexes, they do stay up to date. When you use a, an external product like Sphinx or Solar, then you get a, a, a open up a great new complexity, which is how to make sure that the index has the latest data, and that is uh, essentially, uh, in my opinion, an unsolved problem. In the uh, uh, that is, it takes work to make sure that they stay in sync, and it may require periodic uh, refreshes. So either scrapping the index and rebuilding it from scratch, or uh, adding new documents to it. In the case of Solar, you can uh, add documents incrementally to an index. Uh, you'd have to write a, a program to do that. But for example, you could, uh, uh, as you, your application is inserting new rows to your database, you could also have the same application add documents one by one into the Solar index. I showed the example of the data import handler only to show the bulk loading initially. In Sphinx, it's a little bit more tricky. Adding in new items to an index is a very expensive process. So what Sphinx has done is they've created a, a new type of uh, index called the real-time index, uh, which is in memory only. It's not persisted to disk. And that is uh, uh, useful for sort of a supplementary amount of indexable uh, uh, text so that now you can t query both the historical data in your persistent Sphinx index plus the uh, data in the real-time index and get a more up-to-date result. But again, you would have to be uh, adding content into the real-time index. I didn't go into depth on, uh, on doing that with the real-time index. I didn't do tests to see what the benchmarks were for that nor did I explore exactly what the process was for uh, uh, incrementing, incrementally updating that real-time index. Uh, and I have also read that uh, trying to merge those two, the real-time index, combine it with the, uh, the persistent one on disk is kind of tricky, or uh, you'd basically be better, better off to just re-index the whole data set. So that seems like a drawback to Sphinx, that uh, if you have a frequently updating uh, data set, it can be a little bit tricky to make sure that the index is also up to date and a little bit tricky to code your application to make sure that you're querying indexable data that's up to date. But that's kind of goes along with any of those external solutions. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, did you compare relevancy of search results between each engine? And if yes, which one seems the best? No, I didn't compare relevancy uh, or, or to see if the, uh, the different solutions were getting the exact same results in the, in the same uh, weighting. Uh, I assumed that the, the uh, uh, matching would give you uh, a similar result on subsequent runs in a given uh, solution, but I wasn't comparing them between each other. So that, that is another nuance that uh, could affect your decision as to whether to use one solution over the other, which is, and that, uh, which is how accurate is the uh, uh, the results for the purpose that you need to use it for, and that I couldn't really compare or cite any one that's better than the other, because the relevancy is really application specific. You really need to evaluate that for your project and to see if it's going to uh, uh, be the appropriate type of results for what you needed to do. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, the next question is, <clears throat> excuse me, if the Sphinx index isn't in sync, will the out of sync rows not be found? Correct. If you have an uh, index that was built at 8 o'clock this morning and you've had three hours of new data inserted into your uh, uh, MySQL database, and you don't have any way of you don't have any process of uh, resynchronizing that or using the real time index to supplement it, then you would basically end up doing a search against the full text index 
getting some rows back, but they would only be rows that existed at the time you built that index. That is, anything that was added to your database afterwards would not be uh, returned by the uh, query against that full text index. And that's the drawback of having these external indexes, is that you uh, then have to decide, well, how important is it to get the absolute up-to-date data? Uh, how frequently do I need to refresh my index? Is there a way that I can uh, uh, create a short-term supplementary index like the Sphinx's real-time index uh, to so that I now have to search two indexes, but it's relatively easy to search the supplementary one, and then periodically, say once a once every two days or once a week, uh, rebuild the, uh, the index on disk so that it has all the historical information. So yeah, it can be tricky and uh, add some complexity to your whole project to have to have these indexes that uh, aren't kept in sync for you. Okay, very good. Uh, do we have any final questions? If, uh, if you have any questions here, we have about two minutes left. Uh, please submit them via the question box. Uh, if we don't have any more, we will wrap it up here in just a second. All right, I don't see any uh, additional questions coming in. So, uh, Bill, thank you for uh, today's webinar, and uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Oh, I, I see one more question here we can answer before we wrap it up. Um, last question, uh, do you know if there's a good reference that discusses what technologies might be most adequate for various application types? Uh, interesting question. I don't have a reference on the top of my head, but uh, why don't I uh, look for one and uh, we can follow up in a blog post, and I'll post that there. And I can also uh, uh, try to write up the other answers to these questions that came in at the end here. OK, very good. Well, Bill, uh, again, thank you for today's webinar. Thanks for everyone for attending. And uh, we will have uh, a couple uh, new webinars in September, October, and November as well. So uh, please keep your eyes open for our uh, upcoming webinar announcements. We hope you can attend uh, future events. And we hope to see you at uh, Procona Live New York in uh, October or Percona Live London at uh, in December. And uh, uh, again, Bill, thank you. And uh, uh, this will uh, conclude today's webinar. Thanks, Terry.